OK, good evening, everybody. And a warm welcome to those attending the Major Applications Planning Committee and to our viewers watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon, London. My name is Councillor Steve Tuckwell and I am the Chairman of this meeting. Details of the business to be considered today are shown on the agenda, copies of which are accessible online underneath the live broadcast. For those present in the room um, and intending to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statements you make will be recorded and made public. A reminder to anyone speaking today that your voice will only be audible online if the microphone is switched on. For fire alarms, we are not expecting a fire drill, but if one does go off, then can you please follow officers to the fire exits and out of the building to the designated meeting points. I think all councillors and uh, members and officers are well aware of the mobile devices, so I could just ask if you could turn them to silent for this, this evening so we're not disturbed. Um, and for any meeting feedback, um, for those watching online, there is a link underneath today's broadcast, underneath the uh, underneath the broadcast that you can fill in and send in. Okay, attendees, I'm going to introduce the councillors and the officers present this evening and we'll start off with we have Councillor Higgins, the Vice Chairman of this committee. We also have Councillor Duncan, who is our Opposition Lead. We have Councillor Chapman, we have Councillor Cawthorn, we have Councillor Mathers and we have Councillor Yarrow. So those are the voting members this evening. We're also joined by officers who uh, help us with proceedings and we have the Deputy Director of Planning and Regeneration, James Roger. We have our Strategic and Major Planning Officer, Mandip Maholtra. We have our Transport and Planning Officer, Alan Tilley. We have our Legal Advisor this evening, Nicole Cameron. And uh, we have our Democratic Services Officer this evening, uh, Neil Fraser. Okay, those are all of the Chairman's announcements and domestic arrangements. We can now go into the main agenda. So we'll start with Agenda Item 1. Apologies for absence, Neil. Thank you, Chairman. All members are present. Okay, thank you. Agenda Item 2 is declarations of interest in matters before this meeting. Have we got any declarations of interest? Not seeing anybody indicate. Okay, thank you. Agenda Item 3 is to receive and agree the minutes of the last meeting, which was the 29th of March. Can I take that those are agreed? Agreed. Thank you, Neil. We can make a note of that, Neil. Thank you. Agenda Item 4 this evening is matters notified in advance or urgent, which there are none. And Agenda Item 5 is to confirm that uh, the public and private elements of this meeting. I can confirm all items this evening are in Part 1, which is public. There are no Part 2 or private items. We have agenda items 6, 7 and 8 this evening, which will be taken in that order, and we have no petition items this evening. OK. That brings us now to agenda item 6, which is the land east of 1040 Uxbridge Road in Hayes. And I'm going to pass over to Mandip to present the application to the committee. Over to you, Mandip. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, members. Agenda item number 6 is, the, is an application at land to the east of 1040 Uxbridge Road, the application site is outlined in red here. One of the things I did want to highlight was that your plan pack incorrectly showed the location of the site as a very, very small red line um, parcel. Um, so it has been corrected in this submission that was circulated yesterday, but we didn't feel it necessary to resend the entire plan pack. This is not an approved drawing uh, for the purposes of planning application. Uh, so this is the location. We have the Point West building, which is uh, a significantly sized building along the Uxbridge Road as our point of interest, as well as the Uxbridge Courts and the uh, Beck Theatre, which is located within the vicinity of the site. This is our constraints plan, so you can see that the site is, has no, um, no constraints itself, and the blue denotes the town centre, uh, the secondary shopping area of Uxbridge Road. There are no parking management schemes and there is a park across the road which is uh, designated as a conservation area. If I take you through the planning application itself, the application proposes the demolition, sorry, there is no demolition, it's an existing car park which has been uh, primarily, well, historically used to serve the Point West building. Now, Point West was converted to residential and um, hostel uses some time ago and the car park has been vacant and redundant for some time. Uh, so the application is proposing to redevelop the vacant car park or the underused car park to provide 20 residential units um, of which we have four one beds, seven two beds, eight three beds and a four bed, park, uh, a four bed unit. There are also seven on-site car parking spaces. I'll take you through the planning application. So this is the proposed site plan. We have primary vehicular access from the residential roads to the north 
and there is a small pedestrian access point which runs um, in this orientation here, sorry for those looking at this map, um, and that takes you directly out onto the Uxbridge Road um, which runs along the south. The application would also then propose ground floor residential units which have access to um, their own dedicated gardens, whereas upper floor units would have access to balconies and there is an a central area of communal amenity space. Uh, one of the things to highlight here is that we the ground floor plan has changed quite significantly since the application was first lodged. The application when it first came in proposed zero affordable housing and comprised of a basement which the basement solely served to provide car parking for the on-site residents. Now one of the things that we've done to move this application into a a better world for affordable housing, but also something that we could support was to remove the basement, which which meant that the scheme was then viable, um, and the application only has, uh, I say only, only has seven car parking spaces, but the site is in a PTAL 3 location, and this close to the Uxbridge Road it is deemed to be a sustainable location. We do also have um, contributions towards other measures to enhance the walking and cycling experiences. Uh, we also have parking permits. Um, restriction clause in our heads of terms, so that's page number nine. So the area is not in a parking management zone as existing. However, if one were to be implemented, and that would be primarily in these residential roads to the north, um, this, app this site and all future residents would be excluded from applying for a parking permit um, to alleviate <coughs> any harms caused. Again, we have the ground floor plan here. The first floor plan shows the L-shaped block with the parking predominantly in the northeastern corner. The second floor plan, the third floor which shows the reduction in the mass of the building where it then focuses itself in the southwestern corner only, and then the fourth floor plan. So the roof plans that you can see also show the PV panels which is the energy, um, the sustainable energy measures proposed and here is the roof plan. So for context, it's very useful to see this plan. So I've obviously talked um, briefly about the size of Point West and how large it and dominant it is on the Uxbridge Road. And this provides you with some context. So the application site is <coughs> next door to Point West and is significantly lower than that. The, the other surrounding sites are predominantly three stories. There are two story residential houses further to the north. <coughs> so this was felt to be a, a, an adequate compromise in terms of building height and mass. For this application site, these are the proposed elevations with again Point West in the distance. Further elevations, and these are your um, BRE guideline plans. So we were looking at whether the, the proposals would breach daylight sunlight requirements, and they don't. It w it's been designed in order to ensure that uh, there are no impacts on the, the two story residential properties to the north. Urban greening factor we have. Um, plans for the, uh, gardening, uh, sorry, the ground floor gardens to serve the ground floor units which are here, as well as additional planting um, and sustainable drainage across the site. Go through some photographs of the development site, but if I just point out, these are the residential roads I was talking about, so they are the predominantly suburban uh, two-story properties, Point West being the largest uh, building in the centre, directly adjacent to the site. And the majority of the frontage is approximately three stories in height. This is the application site, so it has been used um, in the past storing cars. So this was, it was not in use as car parking serving Point West. It was quite literally a car park to store vehicles. I'm not going to say it was off airport parking, but it could have been. Um, but again, it was, it was not serving the function of the, in association with Point West. Oh, sorry. So the application is recommended for approval. As I've mentioned briefly, the proposal does deliver 35% on-site affordable housing, which comprises of uh, five affordable rent units mm. and two shared ownership units, which is policy compliant. The unit mix also delivers nine out of the 20 flats as three bedroom family units. Now that's something that we don't come across very often, so it's very much supported and one of the things that weighs significantly in favor of this development. Uh, the application has been recommended for approval um, and the planning obligations are and conditions start at page eight of the committee report. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much um, for that mandate.
James, did you want to reference anything in relation to this before we go to the debate for members? Yes, so we have a sort of a fully policy compliance scheme, um, and it actually has uh, what I'd call an exemplar daylight, sunlight, and overshadowing uh, report that um, um, uh, uh, where the consultants have gone through literally every window, garden of adjoining properties, have um, uh, looked at the um, daylight and sunlight of the proposed flats and um, quite simply uh, it um, is totally acceptable in terms of BRE guidelines in terms of daylight and sunlight so um, yes I would, um, would uh, um, it, it, the recommendation is for approval thank you chairman okay thank you right this isn't a petition item I haven't got anybody here um, speaking on this so we can go straight to the debate I've got Councillor Higgins, who's first to indicate. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I like this. Um, I like the mix, and I like the fact that it's got the panels on the roof, and I'm sure I th it's got the grey water thing in it. I'm sure that's got that in there, and, I, and the, all the things we like, actually, which is nice. It's nice that officers sort of like begin to know us, and maybe the next four years coming up, maybe get to know us again. But um, it, it, so and and I love it. I love the fact that we've actually got one four bedroom, which I think, as a committee, we've been hanging on about this for very many years, and and we've got it. So you know, so I'm happy to support and um, and go with officer recognition. The only other thing, the point that I would like to say is about the parking. I don't know whether it, I'm. I have no problem with it being seven, but I want to know how is it has is it allocated or not. And should it be, should one of the spaces be allocated definitely to the four bedroom? Because I would have think that will be a family home. Yeah, I, I'm noticing now. I just want officers to. Support. So I will propose it as well. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Higgins. Um, the question about parking allocation is that one for Alan, maybe, to pick that up? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I would certainly. Um, require the car parking spaces to be allocated and it would be a very good idea to allocate at least one of the, well, one of those spaces to the four bedroom unit. Um, there is a parking allocation and management plan um, as a condition. Chairman, thank you. Did you want to come in, James? Um, if, if members wish, we could easily change that condition so that the, the, the four bed unit, it, it is actually specified in the condition as, as being titled to one of the spaces. Yeah, I think we get some nods on that one, so, okay, thank you. Well, I've got uh, Councillor Cawthorn followed by Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm very familiar with the site from my days as Cabinet Member for Housing, of course, because Point West is a building that uh, we have used and continue to use. Uh, very aware that in the, the footpath between Point West and the site, uh, there has been in the past a significant amount of uh, antisocial behaviour. And I'm just, uh, I, I don't know whether that's the latest position, I've not been there for a while, but I just wonder to what extent this has been picked up with the Metropolitan Police Crime Prevention Design Advisor or whether those are conversations still to be had as part of this. So, ju just that one question, please. Okay, and then we have a secure by design condition, but I'm sure officers might want to pick up point that you make there. James or Mandip. Apologies. Um, sorry, we were just having a quick conversation. Now, we have secured monies um, in the heads of terms, which is the ATZ works. Now, those are primarily those along the main Uxbridge Road. We did informally look into whether we could secure contributions to upgrade what I think is this area here that Councillor Cawthorn is referring to. Mm. However, it is in private ownership, so it doesn't, it's not as simple as, um, as yes, as securing money and then doing the works on someone else's land. So it was something we definitely looked into, and I think it might be something that could occur if Point West were to be redeveloped, but I don't know if that's um, on the horizon. Th th thank you for the answer. Can I just say I, I, I support the proposals as well. I think it's a very improvement. Having said that. Was, that, was that second in, Councillor? I'm happy, I'm happy, happy to be the second. Absolutely. Okay. That's helpful. No, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Yes, good to see um, this land being used for um, housing purposes and 
uh, nice mix as well. Um, I did notice in the report that um, access for waste uh, collections, refuse vehicles was um, difficult in the comments and that some different arrangements might have to be made. I wonder if there's any more information about that, please. That was the first thing. Um, and then, could you just confirm what the red hatched area is on the plan? And also, it says there are pedestrian, uh, well, um, secure, secure gates, but with pedestrian access. Uh, also, on the refuse vehicle issue, um, this might also affect access for um, uh, things like uh, furniture vehicles, you know, people, you know, ordering furniture. Um, I think it was about the turning arrangements that there might be uh, that the comments were for. And on the allocation of parking, um, which is 14, uh, yes, I'm very happy uh, that there be a, a specified parking place for the four-bed property. Um, but I hope that's not going to um, be taken out of the two disabled access spaces so that there'll be two disabled, one for the full bed and then the rest will be unallocated as it says here if people are happy with that. So they're just my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Duncan. Right, three, three points there or possibly four. Um, the waste collection. Alan, can you able to pick that up? I do note from the report that there's quite a bit of comment from the highways officer that's addressing some earlier concerns. So maybe you could just take us through how that panned out. Apologies, I'll take um, this point now. If you go to page 53 and 54, what is actually happening is that because of the restricted nature of the site, the development is requiring um, a managed refuse collection solution. So a managing agent will always need to be on site to deliver the bins to a specific location to be agreed with the local planning authority, and that's how the refuse will be collected. Those bins will then need to be moved by the specific management company back into, back to where they need to go. Now, I have just realized that there is no condition asking for that management plan, and there should have been. So a, a failing on our part, so I will update that we need to add the refuse management plan as a condition to be secured in perpetuity. Um, I just say thank you. I did see that in the report, um, and I did see that there wasn't um, a condition. Is this something that has been used before successfully? Because while I can understand there might be a member of staff moving bins around, What's going to happen with furniture deliveries when John Lewis van turns up and can't get in? Is there going to be <laughs> is there going to be someone wheeling the furniture? In? Okay, I mean in, it's in a mutual. <laughs> it's a mutual. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I, I, I'm I'm aware of where we've had uh, managed um, arrangements where somebody comes and brings bulk bins out to a central point. It works quite well, but it's, it's a good point around other deliveries that you're making. So, Alan, is that something you can augment it between you? So I can answer two of your questions in one. The red area hatched on the plan is actually the drop-off point, and that relates to condition number 18. So there is a dedicated drop-off point for vehicles. It's not fantastic if there's more than one vehicle, but we are uh, it's a development that's not got a huge quantity of units, so one space was felt to be sufficient. I'm going to look to Alan to maybe pick that one up to a regular day-to-day -day delivery routines. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, it would be quite acceptable for vehicles to um, reverse down the access road and um, unload within the, um, within the site, hatch. within the plot. The, uh, the red markings, I might add, also protect entry and exit for the cycle parking. But for, for deliveries, a vehicle would certainly reverse into the site and uh, people would take the fridges and settees, etc., out of the out of the vehicle. Okay. Do, do you want to come back on that, councillor? Can I just say that will there be some double yellow lines or something 
because it's a very tight access on a bend and if there are cars parked there because this is all surrounded by residential there will be um, on street parking uh, heavier at some times than at others I accept but otherwise it's going to be very difficult for uh, a large vehicle to reverse with that particular configuration that is something we could look into um, we would normally take a contribution from the developer to pay for the traffic order making I'll probably look to James is that opportunity still there we have a section 278 yeah. in the head. So, oh, thank you. So that would fall under a section 278 uh, that they would be required to provide the double yellow lines and the traffic order making associated. Thank, thank you, you, Chairman. And then that would give enough for, well, at some point there might have to be um, parking management, um, but enough for a large vehicle to swing round and um, enter the site, yeah, in that way. Okay, thank you. Yes. And then you had a final point about the pedestrian gates. Yes. So if one of the guys can, can pick that one up. Pedestri the question was around there's some pedest mentioned pedestrian gates in the report. Shown on the plan, secure gates with pedestrian access. So that, that means that this is closed, isn't it, much of the time? vehicles. So it's just to, to clarify how they operate and what the so where will are. The, so where will the refuse vehicle, I suppose, will have to have a fob or something and, uh, and trade vehicles to get through there? Because there isn't any space up to the gate within the body of the site. Do you see what I mean? I have to apologise, I think some of the plans haven't been updated. Now there is the gates on some of your plans are at the f at the front. Very entrance. Yeah. But I think what's been negotiated through the planning application is that it's been moved into the site to overcome your concerns. So that you could reverse, yeah. And also to to prevent the backing up onto the highway. So uh, yeah. we will make a note that we should get plans updated to show the single gates not at the mouth of the entrance to the site. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, good. No, thanks uh, for clarifying that, Mandit. Well, I've got Councillor Chapman. Uh, actually, you haven't, Chairman. I'm afraid Councillor Duncan's managed to cover both of my questions. We could always go over I, again. I, I, will, I, was, I will actually, thinking about it, ask a third one, if I may, just to okay. clarify. Reference has been made to the gates bottom left, uh, bottom left on the map, so to speak, providing direct access off the Uxbridge Road. I'm assuming that they're pedestrian access. W would they be sort of secure and via a key fob only? Pedestrian access key fobs. The the pedestrian access along that stretch is not controlled um, by the local planning authority. It is under private control, but it is generally open dusk till dawn. Um, I was thinking in terms of access to the site, so to speak, at the top of the alleyway as opposed to at the bottom. I appreciate between the houses on the Uxbridge Road, we can't regulate that, but in terms of at the top of that site, purely for access onto the site we're looking at. Yeah, basically, if you, sorry Chairman, if you look at that map, you've got the gates bottom left. I'm referring to those gates as opposed to further south on the Uxbridge Road itself. I presume we could, if we want, regulate those. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to look at Mandit here who's... I don't believe we can. I, I believe they're outside of the red line, so the land that's owned by the applicants. If we go back to the main... Yes, so I apologise that, yep. for that confusion. OK. The police might not like that. Uh, that might come up as a secure by design mm -hmm. issue as well, Alan. Yeah. OK. Thank you. It's a good spot, everybody. Um, Councillor Cawthorn, you indicated again. Yes, just a f one last bite. The chair, if I may, uh, Chairman, this is a on the back of Councillor Duncan's point on uh, uh, waste management. I, mean, I welcome the uh, condition around that. Uh, j just to drill into the bit of the detail, though, does this 
include the management of food waste because we know it's a big struggle for us. I've raised this before, and we're having a big push on flatted development. So, is, is this something we can secure as part of this? I, I think Condition Sorry. 9 specifically re references food waste recycling. And then I've missed it so in that case. No, uh, is that there. yes? Oh, that's fine. No. Th thank you very much. No, that's, it's, it's good to, uh, to ensure that those things are included. I am right. I'm assuming there. Yep. Uh, yeah, we, we've updated our standard conditions that has food waste in it, so hopefully you shouldn't be having to raise this. At I, I was going to say, if I can take it to the general, <laughs> through you, Chairman, if I can take it to the general point moving forward, I shall throw <laughs> hold my piece. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, again, this committee does produce some very good scrutiny, so uh, thank you for your, your questions. Um, on this on this application, um, but I'm not seeing any more members indicate they want to speak. So I'm just going to try and pull this together so we know what we're voting on. So we've got um, parking allocation um, to sp specifically reference one for the four bedroom, and we definitely want to avoid losing any disabled bays as a result of that. So those will still be available to the site. We're going to add a waste management condition, and I'm just going to ask officers if we do we need to refer to the double yellow lines in the 278 line on the heads of terms. Yeah. Yeah, but do we need to reference double yellow lines on that? Yeah. So if we're happy, we'll delegate to officers to make those amendments. Okay. Um, and that's what we're voting on. So can I have a show of hands for this application? So that's unanimous to approve that, Neil. So agenda item six this evening is approved. Thank you very much, everybody, for your contribution. So we can now move swiftly on to agenda item 7, which is Saxon Way in Harmonsworth. And over to you, Mandip. Thank you, Chairman. Agenda item number 7 is fairly straightforward. We, we are looking at an existing um, industrial estate um, called the Saxon Trading Estate. I may have got the wrong name. No, nope, Saxon Way Trading Estate um, in Harmonsworth. Now, the application is purely to uh, externally refurbish the development site. So the site constraints plan does identify that the whole of the site is in the Greenbelt, but it is an existing development, so previously developed land within the Greenbelt. The application would look to um, refurbish what is looking like a slightly tired development site. So we have quite a few different blocks within the estate. Each of those would be reclad. Um, now, one of the key things, we have some existing elevations that I'm just running through here and some proposed elevations. You can't see a lot from the plans, um, but it is proposed that they would be upgraded um, to be more attractive uh, when marketed. So these are the typical colours of the cladding um, for the elevations. The application is recommended for approval, and it is here because obviously the application site boundary is so significant it makes it a major development. But in all other respects, um, the works don't constitute constitute um, development that would trigger things like the air quality and the energy. So you'll see that the report is fairly light touch, and that's primarily because it's just external cladding. So the application is recommended for approval. Um, we have a few images on the screen for you now. Okay, thank you uh, for that mandate. Um, right, we can go straight to the debate. Councillor Higgins. Um, a little bit... No, I think... We need more of this anyway because we've taken a lot of this away um, and it's all been converted to housing and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm in favour of, of, of this in principle. Um, I noticed that the cladding is an upgrade and it's fire safety. That's fine. The only issue that I'm concerned about is I don't, at the moment, how many HD vehicles go on site at the moment uh, in the sense that is it because the roads look quite narrow there I don't know what sort of vehicles are getting on there at the moment and when you get a developer that a development that's a lot better you you encourage maybe I just think we need to I just want to be more cautious about what the, what is going on to the site I think I don't know whether I don't maybe it's not a planning I'm going to get told off in a minute but <laughs> as I usually do but why not why, why not change the habit of a lifetime no the thing is that's all I want to know I want to know about access onto the site so, really so the main thing we've done with this application is because it is simply upgrading all the cladding, we haven't looked at the highways, the uh, all of the other sort of environmental considerations, because we've taken the view we don't think uh, we, we, we don't, that we can take them into account because it is simply the cladding, and that's the main thing we've done with this application. Uh, we've, we've taken the view that. Um, 
and, and, and that's why in this case that it is very light on planning conditions. So uh, the advantage of that, I would say, is that because they don't have to do lots of pre-commencement conditions, uh, if you agree the decision tonight, they can start work straight away. So, so the, 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 there is a flip side to that. <laughs> Cut through you, Chairman. Then I'm going to go. Is the cladding environmental friendly, and is there an opportunity for us to maybe an informative to, to sort of use the cladding in more of an energy efficient way or something like that? Apart, from, I mean, I mean, I, I know I'm, all I'm concerned about is the, it's in the it is in the I know it's already there, but it's in a green belt area. I just don't want to be losing that <coughs> to heavy goods vehicles just trunching down there and so on. So. And I just, want, I just want to make it more, have a green roof, but I suppose we can't do that, but I'm going a bit too far the, here. The key informative we wanted to add was the asbestos one, because we, yeah. Good. we, yeah. we there could be asbestos here, and that's, yeah. but that's there, so when I look at the informatives, the one okay. I wanted there is there. Okay. <laughs> so sorry, right, I'm not being very helpful. No, 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 you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to just ask the questions and you to tell me no, really, or yes, whatever it would be. <laughs> so um, that's the question I ask, and if, if it's not part of our remit, then it's not part of our remit. So I'll move on. I will propose it as well. I don't okay. I mean, I'll, I'll just to, to, to settle you there, Councillor, I think I might ask Nicole if there's any anything to... Uh, because it's, I think it's not a bad point. It's not, it's not a bad point in, in relation to... And I think there might be some people... There might be some people watching, thinking yeah. the, the same question. So... I don't know if there's anything you can add to that debate. The only, the only thing that I would highlight is that the fire safety report would have been based on the planning applications that came forward, which would have had certain materials, and therefore I don't know whether, you know, sort of eco-friendly materials would change uh, their, their statement. I don't know. So I think you really have to make a decision based on what's for you, um, and I don't think there's a possibility... You could put an informative for sure that says something along the lines to use materials that are fire safety compliant. Um, I can't remember the, the BR 187. For you, Chairman. Yeah, it's just that we've had something that's been brought to my attention a while ago with a cricket club, and they wanted to change the cladding, um, and then they were told that they had to have eco-friendly cladding because they weren't, didn't want to use wood, they wanted to use something that would last a long, lot longer. And that's in a conservation area. And I just wondered if the, this is where my thinking is going, because it's in a green belt area, do we have that same control? That's, that's where I'm coming from. If we haven't, I'm, you know, I'll be quiet. But that's the, that's the reason behind it, because we have planning applications coming, so we pick up different things from different things, and I just want to know whether that will relate to this one. Do you want to come back on that? Um, or? I mean, all I would add is that, yeah, I think it's relevant that obviously it's in the green belt, yeah. um, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that takes away from my mm. point. Um, no, and I think if there is a possibility, the only way would probably, uh, that would meet the, I, I don't think it would make, meet the planning conditions, uh, the legal yeah. test for that, but it would, an informative would be helpful. And then maybe this is something that we need to think about going forward with future applications of a similar nature. Okay. Is there anything we can do with an informative here? I think simply to ask that the applicant considers or investigates energy efficient cladding, um, and that would relate to the performance internally, primarily. Uh, the one thing I would say on your point about it's in a con your or the other example in the conservation area, this is obviously there and existing on, in the green belt. So what we're doing is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I was a bit concerned about the... Uh, it will be replaced with modern micro-rib cladding, profile sheets and bonded plywood in light and dark grey colours. So all a bit grey and sombre, but nevertheless OK on the colours. But if it's bonded plywood, that doesn't sound very fire safe to me. And it says under 722, fire safety. Well, if you remember, the head of um, London Fire Brigade was speaking on television about how very concerned he is 
about a lot of the materials and practices in construction um, that are simply not fire safe. And this is despite, um, you know, fire statements being submitted. So I don't know how the internal processing works on those matters, but we all know that on all sorts of aspects, yes, there's an expert that puts in a statement and um, it's approved because it meets, you know, some written policy requirement. But uh, if this is going to be wood, uh, or part of it is going to be wood, then I just hope that it is uh, to systems, which I suppose all of us have become a bit wary of um, out hearing how widespread, even on very modern buildings, um, fire safety issues are and how much they are costing uh, the owners or the occupiers of these buildings. So I don't know if there is some way that we can uh, put this in an informative or part of the condition, but if there is some way, I would like to put that in because obviously it is something uppermost in all our minds, particularly when the word cladding is the subject of the, the development. But otherwise, glad to see that it is going to be refurbished and um, made more attractive, particularly as it's in a green belt setting. So I'm happy to second it. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I was just, so anyone watching knows what I was whispering, I, I was asking if Mandip could look at the back offs to see if there's anything not in the report that helps address councillors' concern, but Mandip's shaking her head, so <laughs> um, um, I don't think, unless you spotted anything, Mandip, there's anything we can add to what's in the report. No, but we specifically have been to not just relied on the, the fire safety statement that has been provided to us, we have taken it to the council's building control team um, and they have said that they're satisfied with the principles of, uh, of the proposals. They do want to see the final fire statement, but that comes at building control stage. Um, so uh, on that basis, we are, we are content with the materials that are being used and that they meet the requirements. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Councillor Higgins, do you want to come back on anything? Yeah, no, I'm I'm, I know it's plywood, but it can be fire retarded anyway, so I, I'm hoping that in the, that's what's happening. So, but, uh, but I totally agree with you. It's, uh, it's, one of, it's wood, yeah, wood burns. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, there you go. It does indeed. Okay, but again, some, some good, healthy debate. Um, rather than just nodding these things through, we like to, to really sort of tease them through and uh, get underneath... Um, underneath these applications. So thank you very much. Well, we are moved and we are seconded. I'm not seeing any other members indicate they want to speak, so I can go to the vote, please. All those in favour? That's unanimous, Neil. So agenda item seven this evening is approved. Thank you very much. And that takes us now to the final item this evening, which is agenda item eight, Tudor Works on um, Beaconsfield Road in Hayes. So over to you, Mandy. Thank you, Chairman. Agenda item 8 is land at Tudor Works. The application site is outlined in red on our screens and it is a borough boundary site. So the borough boundary runs north to south along, the, I think it will be better shown on the next plan. There we go. So there's our borough boundary. So we are very close to the London Borough of Ealing here. Uh, we have a school located here. There is a, um, a care home in the distance. And on one of these plans, I should I think it's one of the later plans. We should be able to show you the site in the context of the new Southall Gas Works redevelopment site. So the application site is in the uh, strategic industrial location, so it's, it's safeguarded for industrial uses and business uses. It is not within the green belt. However, the green belt is directly on the opposite side of the application site. So you may recall we've had applications at Planning Committee fairly recently for the new school, um, for the new Gurunanic primary school, I believe, uh, which is on one of these two plots here, with the, with the more substantive uh, secondary school over to uh, the west. This is the um, site location plan. So the application would propose the provision of two new buildings on the site. This is the existing site plan, so everything here would be demolished. And we're looking at a site plan here, which shows building number one, and building number two. Now the application uh, proposals have been set back from the uh, site boundary. 
You'll notice that there's swathes of green infrastructure along the southern section of the site. Now, these are proposals that the Southall Gas Works redevelopment must deliver. So that is link, it would link into a new pedestrian and cycle footbridge, which takes you across uh, through Minette Country Park into the Southall Gas Works site. So what have we have sought to do through this application is, is ensure that it's well connected to what will be that piece of, of new public realm from Southall Gas Works into the new application site. The Springfield Road is actually a dead end here, so we're looking at making improvements into how it looks at the moment, and there will be a small um, vehicle round, well, I'm going to call it a turning circle or turning head at the end of the road um, to take you back out via this dead end. There will be a small, um, I'm going to call it a gatehouse building, uh, which would which would um, authorise access in and out of the site. There is vehicular access through the site into sort of a yard area to the rear, but the primary car parking area for any uh, for any um, employees would be along the site frontage. And then some parking bays to the north. Now the application proposes um, two new data centre buildings. Now we've seen quite a few plans for data centre buildings. I'm going to say that we probably know that they're generally stacked with um, equipment and computers and hardware, software to store data. Therefore, the primary use, um, the, well, the main areas of the site are not used by um, by persons. However, there are offices associated with the um, operation of the data centre, and they are pr they've primarily been focused along the site frontage in order to provide some activity um, when you, so interaction along Springfield Road and Beaconsfield Road, but also um, to add to the public realm that's being delivered by the Southall Gas Works site. Now, one of the nuances with this application is that it is significant in terms of its scale. It will be a circa 35 metre building in height. Now, the London plan um, specifically has, um, has policies which guide the intensification of um, our strategic industrial locations. We have spoken um, at many planning committees about the number of strategic industrial sites which have been released for residential development. And for those reasons, the London Plan now has a policy which specifically guides intensification for all of that land that has been retained for strategic industrial uses. So this is a, this is a very good example of an application that will, of a site and a development that will intensify the way in which this safeguarded um, industrial land is used. So the application site, uh, these are the elevations for the proposal. They ha there has been extensive discussions about the materiality in order to make sure that we are providing an exemplar scheme in insofar as it is a significant size and scale um, and height. Now, we the, the applicant team have been very receptive and they have been through numerous design workshops and we feel we've come to um, a design which enhances um, given the scale and size of the building, but it is it is an application site which is outside of this, the council's preferred tall buildings locations, which are only Uxbridge and Hayes. However, the design and, and other um, benefits have gone far beyond in order to counterbalance that minor conflict. We also have some public art going onto the side of the building, which is shown on the bottom right-hand side image. And then we, it's not called Minette Country Park, but this is an area that would be denoted for future signage. So we, we thought it would be in, uh, a useful exercise to put those markers down of where the signage would be. The public art um, is also going to be a collaboration with the school across the road, um, and that's a commitment that's been made by the applicant team. Now, there is an addendum on this item. Um, so we have a few sections, sorry, I'll go through those, and we have some urban green factor plans. So as much enhancement to the public realm has been sought, um, as well as a terrace area for the to serve the offices on one of the two buildings. Um, if we go through the addendum very briefly, and I don't normally go through each item, so I won't labour. However, one of the heads of terms, um, sorry, no, let's start at the beginning, and that's with uh, the carbon emissions. So the carbon emissions, I just wanted to clarify, we have a significant carbon emission sum for this planning application. That's primarily because uh, the, the target by the London plan is that the development should be net zero carbon. As a result, um, some of the sums that you will probably be seeing going forward will also be significant. So this isn't this isn't a change in how we're measuring um, 
the amount of money that we're securing for carbon offset. However, because policy has changed, previously we had secured a lesser sum. This is now being, we're now securing greater sums because the whole development needs to be net zero carbon with only 35% delivered on site. Um, if we move on to the second page of the addendum, one of the recommendations was proposed to be amended. In the report that was published, we sort of had a to be confirmed note because air quality was still being negotiated. Now, at the time that the addendum was published yesterday, the discussions were still ongoing, so I apologize, and I would like to request a verbal update insofar as um, Section 13 recommendation note, the air quality sums that you have, which are underlined in the text in the, the second box, the first sum says 400, 476,932. Now, following further discussions, that has had to change to 649,490 pounds. So the air quality damage cost, the minimum that the council will receive is the 649,000 pounds that I have just tabled. So I would like to table that as a verbal update. Now, the maximum um, that we may secure at a later date is £1,437,630, so that sum doesn't change. I just wanted to go through why we have such significant air quality damage costs and why we also have two, because it's not something that we've done at planning committee in the past. Now, we have pushed the applicant team to, um, to do as much as they can with their diesel backup generators. Now, one of the key um, requirements for a data centre is to ensure that they have um, backup generators, so in the event of grid failure, the generators would kick in. Now, the generators, however, in themselves need to be tested, um, and for that reason, the testing, in effect, uh, generates the damage costs. Now, most of the generators that we've approved at planning committee um, for our data centres have been diesel fuelled. Uh, we are we have managed to secure, whilst working with the applicant team, a different type of fuel. So we would not be using diesel, we would be using HVO, which is hydrogenated vegetable oil, I believe. Um, however, the science and the data behind whether it is as, whether it is any better than diesel is still in its infancy. And for that reason, what we have done is secure the minimum damage cost and in two years' time, so post-operation, once they've done some monitoring of, of the efficiency of the generators and this new fuel type, we will either seek no further um, air quality damage cost or we will be asking them for the higher cost, potentially because the HBO won't be any better than the diesel. Um, I have tried to put that as simply as I could, um, and I hope it makes sense. But yes, we are, we are pushing for something better on this site. Um, but we're not 100% sure it will actually work. But technology may evolve in the next four to five years by the time we're operational, um, and we may have something even better. So those were the two key things I wanted to highlight from the addendum. We will go carry on through the presentation because there are images that I have missed. Um, now, the application is securing significant economic benefits. Now, they are set out within the application, um, within the body of the officer report, which, again, is very well written. Uh, we've been provided with substantial information about the, um, the economic game, um, both locally and regionally. We have some images of the proposed data. Now, these are CGI, so as we always say, take them with a pinch of salt because they are um, computer generated. But this is an image looking um, towards the London Borough of Ealing along Beaconsfield Road. It is a significantly sized building, um, but it has been set back from the the main road, so to give it as much relief as possible. We are also securing other enhancements, such as this green verge will be amended to be a public footpath, and that will then provide a, a, a true walking route from the new connection from the Southall Gasworks public realm all the way across into the new school, or, well, firstly into the new school, but also into the existing schools on Springfield Road. And um, Minette Country Park. Uh, we have CGI number two, so this is uh, an image of the site at night, which we felt was quite important because it, it is of a significant scale, and so the lighting would be important and how it would be viewed um, at night is, is key. We have some images from the football club, which is located across the road. I think it's called Goals, and the night view as well. No, I've got the wrong site. Yedding football club, sorry. Sports knowledge, I was going to fail. 
Now this is <laughs> so this is an image set slightly further back along Beaconsfield Road. Now um, there has been lots of debate in the office about the accuracy of this image purely because of the way in which the building is only just visible beyond. So this is the proposed development and these are existing buildings. Now if you take into account that the buildings are set back from the site boundary, I don't believe that this is an inaccurate representation, especially when you're at street level and what you see around you would be uh, limited. So yes, again, health warning about CGIs, but um, there is some debate in the office about the accuracy of this, and I, d uh, I can say that I don't feel that it's, uh, it's misrepresentative, but I can't be 100% certain. Sorry about that. We have some images um, of the back of the site as well, which was also felt to be important because there will be some glance images of the site from Uxbridge Road through the existing retail park, albeit there is a significant distance from the Uxbridge Road. <coughs> and this is the new plaza, so this is the way in which the application site would connect with those works that Southall Gas Works um, are required to deliver. <coughs> the application has been recommended for approval. There are significant benefits from this scheme, which um, which have been out, which have been set out in the report. We've also secured significant travel um, and highways and improvements and benefits, which are highlighted in the officer report. And primarily, one of those key ones would be the pedestrianisation of the southern section of the Beaconsfield Road leading up to Minette Country Park. I'm sure I have missed lots, so please do feel free to ask questions. But I will pass back to Councillor um, Capwell. Thank you, Mandip. I'm going to hand over to James, who's going to probably just uh, clarify a couple of points and add a few points, no doubt. Yes. So, so um, in terms of this application, what Office has done over the have done over the past six months is work uh, extensively with the applicant on the design of the scheme uh, and all the different aspects of it, and to, including the air quality, the carbon, and you'll see there's a very comprehensive list of. Uh, heads of terms on page 87 and page 88 of the report and, and uh, quite a number of planning conditions uh, thereafter. So effectively what we've done is in terms of the design and all the environmental impacts, we've taken them as far as we can in, in terms of ensuring the best possible scheme. Uh, so obviously it is a big data centre. Uh, it's a major investment in the borough, but I wanted to also just add a kind of strategic almost overview. Um, so we... Amanda did mention a sort of partial tour building conflict, but in reality a large data centre is not going to go in the middle of Hayes or Uxbridge Town Centre. So you start to get to the point of, um, we know there is the, this uh, uh, a need for these large data centres. They do bring obviously quite a number of jobs with them. They are major investment. So where do you locate them? And, and from that point of view, I think this is actually a good site all things considered, because it is a, a large strategic industrial estate, and you as a committee did quite recently look at an outer borough consultation involving a data centre in the Greenbelt. And I, I, and I feel it isn't unfair for me to raise that, because uh, as a committee uh, and we as officers felt that there isn't a need to be building large data centres in the Greenbelt, but equally the flip side to that is we probably do need to consider where we can allow large data centres and logically uh, that would be in large strategic industrial estates. So uh, um, hence um, officers have taken the view that we think it's the right development in the right location and, and effectively what we've sought to do as I say over the past six months is to try and take the scheme as far, far as we, we think we can in terms of the design features. It, it is obviously a big industrial buildings so in terms of although some members may look at it and sort of wonder why we're saying we think it's a high quality design perhaps those last two CGI's you can see some of the details in terms of it, it isn't a large box it is a, a lot of effort has been made with all sorts of different articulations and setbacks so effectively it, it re that will break, break up the massing in effect so when you're looking at it everything that's going on on the two buildings will ultimately reduce their, the perception of them being very large buildings, put, put, put simply. Um, so, I, yeah, I just wanted to add all, all of those points, and as Amanda 
have said, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, no, thank you for that, James. Uh, as a committee, we've had a number of data centres in front of us, and I'm sure we're going to have a few more um, in, the, in the months ahead. So I've got Councillor Higgins, followed by Councillor Cawthorn, who indicated they'd like to speak. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I like it, to be honest. I think it's in the right place. Um, Hayden Yedding developed Les Ferdinand, who played for QPR and Newcastle in England. And very, but I'll leave you off that mandate. Uh, the only issue I really have about this is obviously some of the, the drawings I saw that there is PV panels at the top of them, read to believe or not, or they were just uh, have uh, basically. My point is, is that I saw some of the drawings. It looked like they were PV panels. They're probably not. But what are they then on the top there? What I would like to, if it isn't there, I would like. That's one of the things I would say that if, because it's generating so many carbon things, it would be good for them to have that on the roof. I like the roof garden as well. It's very good. The main issue that so those are a main issue. The other issue is this end of the road. Um, I don't like the way it's been sort of like it's abrupt at the end. Is there any way that we can curve that into more or extending it? Because I know what's going to happen. People will just park on it and go to the park and stuff. I know it's double yellow on a Sunday. No one's going to care. So it's just a way of just sort of organically bringing it into the site. It's, it's becoming a really great road, actually. It's got film studios down it, everything down it. So I, I just think I, I, there's a lot of positives here, and I like the fact of the economic generation of the area, jobs as well. And we all have our computers and our data, so it has to go somewhere. So this is an ideal, I think, an ideal place for it. But those questions that I just want to know is just, are they maximising out their ability to... Um, yeah, I, I was just um, going to mention the point to sort of partially respond that um, head of term number four, highways improvements, um, we do have that 289,000 pound contribution. So the council, it, 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 council is going to have a have a big say in terms of the uh, yeah. improvements to the. Uh, you chairman, it just looks like a runway that's at the end. You know, it can be. I think it just can be taken more into the environment around it. And on the data stuff... Alan, do you want to come back and how we can soften that road, I think, is what <laughs> Councillor Higgins is referring to, the, the abrupt ending that uh, has been raised. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, that has been picked up in the comments from the Highways Authority, um, but there is... Um, a very good contribution towards highway works and that budget could be used to um, use the correct sort of materials to um, truncate the road that you know reads correctly. Thank you, Chairman. Would you be happy with that, Councillor? Yeah, I, what I'm trying to say is that if it's, it's going to be a turning circle in it, so if you generate it in like a turning circle rather than it's just sort of an area that just comes to an end, so the vehicles that do go down there, they can turn around and go back again in a more organic or holistic way. But uh, yeah, the, the other one is the other question I'm really waiting for. The PV panels. Yes. Okay, we'll hand over to Mandy for that one. Okay. So in our addendum, we did try and clarify they are not PV panels on the roof. They are, I believe, they're more generators. There are, however, wall-mounted PV panels, and that's because data centres can't generally have PV panels on their roof. The energy is via uh, heat recovery systems and water source heat pumps. So there are energy efficient measures, they are just not the traditional PV panels that we're used to seeing. No, that's fantastic, this is something like that. And the, other, the only last thing I've got is the, you showed us the public art. I, it will be in keeping with the area because it is a green belt. I know, I love my, I've got loads of drawings of my son when he was five and six and ten and I wouldn't really particularly like to see them up on the wall. Um, the, the thing is, is the lettering as well. Can we make sure that the lettering is what we see there? You know, because it's very restrained. I know it says Manette, but th if that's the typeface and that, I, you know, I want to make sure that that's what we are actually voting for. There, there is a condition, I think, on that. Maybe there's something we could do with the wording on that. To and uh, that's all I've got, Chairman. Uh, I will propose it as well. Thank okay. You. Sorry, they, they will need to apply for advertisement consent. So, uh, yeah. Uh, um, so there, there'll be a separate proposal that we'll need to put 
Uh, for, 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 for the, the sign that Mandip highlighted that currently says Minette Park, that will actually have its own advert application. Okay, but I think I think what Councillor Higgins was on about is how do we regulate what that image looks like to make sure that it is something that's suitable and in keeping and and does that does the does the uh, condition give us latitude for that? Through you, Chairman, it, it, I suppose my design background comes in now, but it, it, because it where it is, I know the area very, very well. I want something as low key as what we see there before us, because then it, it blends into the thing. I don't want a neon, you know, or some sort of like, you know, maybe Yedding Football Club might put an advert advertising there on there, like Air Asia or something. I don't know. But the point I'm trying to say is that. We want to make sure that we control that it blends in with, because it's on the boundary of the green spaces. You want to make sure that it blends in. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, For wildlife and other issues there, because of lighting. It, and stuff. It, I, yeah, I totally agree uh, with the point you're making, Councillor Higgins. And I think if we did informative, we could sort of explain our expectations to the applicant. So if you, um, I. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it needs to, um, given the green belt um, adjoining it, kind of, yeah, we, we don't want something that's neon or, yeah, yeah it has to be that, that sensitivity. And same with, the, same with the artwork. It has to be sort of blending into the environment that it's around. I was just thinking of pictures of clowns my son used to draw, which would be red and yellow and stuff like that. We don't want to really see that on a green area. It, it's just, and it obviously to be consideration of, of the wildlife that is on the minute is quite a lot. Did you want to come for that, Carl? Um, I would just highlight the uh, the uh, head of term does say the precise nature of the public art and the precise location should be approved by the council. So the head of term is very specific. So it's something that can, all of your, your informative will then feed into that head of term and the precise nature will be agreed by us. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. I've got Councillor Duncan indicated. Well, thank you. Um, yes, the, the, I have some concerns about, obviously, noise and air quality in relation to the school, uh, schools, really, um, particularly as they've been expanded. And um, I see that uh, certainly the testing is going to be done... Um, outside of school hours and noise sensitive times of the day because I believe the noise is one of the things that in certain areas is affecting residential areas so it would certainly affect you know children trying to study and concentrate how much are we able to limit this because I see the the conditions on page 99 noise control of chiller plant noise control of standby generator and noise control of testing of the standby generators. So a lot of you know conditions relating to this, quite rightly. But um, what kind of noise environment is are we going to be left with? Do we have any idea of the level of it? I can see the mitigation measures of outside school hours when you know it's going to be particularly noisy. But what is the operating noise level going to be? Because that can be quite disturbing for people. Is that something you can pick up, Mandy? I can. I think we, we would have to accept that it will be noisy, mm -hmm. um, and for that reason we've tried to limit the hours when it can be tested to when it has the least impact. Um, and that was the, um, the most efficient way of doing it. The application site is in a sill, so we have to it is a noisy location in its own right. Um, so we, we accept those principles and we had to work with, within the confines of what we have and that was limiting the harm and that would be during those hours, those school hours. We were given some indications that it's likely to be only to be tested at the weekends. However, we don't want to take the risk of not securing a condition um, because we've been told it will only be at the weekend um, because without a condition it could be tested at any yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so it will be noisy but hopefully at hours when it doesn't affect um, 
a lot of people, uh, a lot of the noise sensitive receptors. Yeah, I just wondered um, if there was anything comparable in terms of, um, you know, a general industrial unit, the kind of noise level that that might generate. But I know they vary, <laughs> isn't it? Um, the other thing was air quality. I mean, gosh, uh, receiving a possible million pounds. Um, how is that money going to be spent? So one of the key things that I probably didn't highlight and should have done is that half of the money will also be sent to the London Borough of Ealing, sent, given to, gifted to uh, the London Borough of Ealing. Now, uh, as I highlighted earlier, the application site is on the borough boundary. Um, Ealing have raised concerns about the, the crosswinds and primarily that the impact will be um, on their residents, on the Blair Peach School and a, and a care home which is on the mm. borough boundary. So on that basis we've we've agreed, uh, well, sorry, we've proposed that 50% of those air quality damage costs would stay yeah. within the London Borough of Hillingdon to look at mitigation um, through the air quality action plan that we have which has lots of uh, proposals and plans that need to be funded and then delivered. Uh, so there are, it's the money that we retain will go towards projects within the air quality management plan which have been identified. So it is a mixture of, of planting but also other um, buffer measures uh, around mainly the Uxbridge Road in this location, um, which is where the main areas or, or the, the key sources of air quality harm would be. So will that be included in, in the planting? Because I'm particularly concerned. Well, I know there will be people working there and there will be people using the Green Belt open space, but I'm particularly concerned about the children, really, that there's as much mitigation as possible to the amount that they're breathing in. Um, because, well, as we know, we're seeing increasing numbers of children affected by pollution, and that's the dreadful case of that mm -hmm. uh, child who died. So I think addressing that, it has been twofold. Firstly, to avoid any testing during the um, school hours, and secondly, it will be through securing the damage costs and implementing some of those strategies, and some of that will be tree planting um, and so on, and also improving uh, by improvements by having a new pedestrian footpath, which leads you safely um, from the application site back to Minette Country Park. Yeah, that's good. And the only other thing, just... Um, on page 87, one of the terms is that um, architect retention, planning obligation to secure retention of high quality architect or equivalent. I don't know who yeah. that would be. Uh, <laughs> What's that for, please? It, it's something that has been successful in other London boroughs where uh, effectively we sometimes get an accusation as a planning authority that we allow a scheme that is of a certain design standard and then it through variations, amendments, condition discharges, somehow the design slips uh, and the more detailed wording of that clause basically through seeks to stop that because in the real world what tends to happen is those, uh, if, if I put it simply the dumbing down, tends to be through different architects. There's actually if you look at where it happens, you'll tend to find that a, a, um, a cheaper architect's brought in and then that it follows that the plan changes aren't the same quality as, as, the, as the original scheme. So that, so effectively we're adopting something that we know uh, other London boroughs have found very effective on very big schemes. Uh, and we've, we've got the applicant to agree it, so we're... Uh, uh, it, it is a first, uh, and so you, you are right to, to, to highlight it, that it's a slightly different clause than the committee seen before, but I can assure committee that uh, Mandip and I have spoken to, to sort of fellow senior planning managers, and it seems to work very well in other boroughs. Well, it certainly sounds a good idea, so Richard Rogers or Norman Foster, here we come, but <laughs> I fully support it. I think it's good, and I'm glad that that is operating in a now standard yeah secure secure high quality development I mean that's what we're required to do by law anyway and this helps with that so thank you thank you and I think we'll be seeing that ahead of term again in the future at some point okay Councillor Cawthorn thank you a couple of observations and then a couple of questions uh, Mandy do you think we can have the CGI up if possible please 
the, the one we had. Uh, that's, that's the one. Thank you. Lovely. Um, I, it was just an observation, really. Th these things are very subjective, although we're uh, beholden to our planning policies. My personal view is actually, you know, that, that, that's not a metal box. That has some uh, some context and character that works in its setting. It is an industrial setting, and I'm not unhappy with that, to be honest. Uh, that, to, me, to me, that works. I think there is clearly, um, as the report references, a uh, minor planning policy conflict in terms of the size of this structure. It, but I think we've done a good job in reconciling uh, you know, the conflicting aspects of this and actually the benefits, you know, looking at the benefits, is exactly what we're supposed to do as a regulatory authority, weighing up the overall planning balance. So my view is that I, I'm, I'm, I support this because I, I think it's got a lot going for it. However, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm curious on pages 12, 112, 113, I'm interested in the exchanges between Hillington and Ealing Highways officers because we're talking about trip generation. Um, so Ealing seems to be saying that this will uh, bring an increase. Uh, we're, we're saying the opposite. I always thought that these kind of assessments were done in a professionally uh, recognised standard way. And what, when officers put these things to us, it's what they're almost a conversation stop. Well, it's professionally done. This is a professional assessment. Therefore, uh, this has to be right. And yet, officers, professional officers from different authorities seem to have a different view on that. So I'm just intrigued on what officers' take is on this. Uh, is it black and white, rather shades of grey? Because I'm just curious, to be honest, because we've had these things discussed before. So that's my first question. My second question is around the, um, the, the seal, if that's correct, as opposed to 106, and the, uh, the allocation of that between authorities. I noticed the 50-50 split, and I wonder whether that is standard practice in circumstances where you have a development right up on, on a borough boundary, or whether, they, you know, whether there's an argument for it to be 60-40. How exactly would we arrive at that? So that, that's my second question, please. Thank you. Uh, I think James is going to take uh, the second uh, one first. Uh, yeah, if I can take the second one, it's something I've sort of taken a particular view on. Um, so there are sensitive receptors in both boroughs. Uh, uh, each borough's got a school, um, uh, and um, it seemed to me that there's definitely a justification, and all the all the experts, both on both our air quality expert and and, and the applicants, agree that effectively there's cross-boundary air quality impacts and it seemed to me that it would be difficult uh, to the, the most equitable way to try and deal with such a situation would, would be a 50-50 contribution because in effect I was struggling to differentiate one or the other by saying uh, uh, that, that the argument stronger it, taking it completely ob objectively that the argument's stronger uh, because in the one borough you've got the residential and the school in Hillingdon you've got the school but it's a bigger school in terms of its area uh, uh, and, and the more I looked into it the more it was difficult to sort of take a sort of scientific view that actually deviated from uh, a 50-50 split being the most appropriate and equitable um, so that's the sort of thought process so, so I, 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 and obviously to be quite blunt we could as a local authority take the view that it, the developments in Hillingdon we're going to take a larger contribution but I haven't looked at it that way I've looked at it in a kind of um, uh, taking the sort of all the expert opinions and then that does seem to be the case that, that there's a sort of expert view that there's in, impacts on both boroughs and that um, Effectively, 50-50 seems a fair way of um, c c c concluding it. Uh, I'm in no position to second guess that. I just wanted how you arrived at it, that's all, and what the thought process is. So, thank you for that. <coughs> Did you want to come in on that, Mandy? I was just going to clarify it's only the air quality <coughs> contribution, 50% of that sum is going to Ealing. The SIL monies will stay within the London Borough of Hellingdon, as will all other Section 106 contributions. Thank you. Okay. And the other point around the, the differential between Hillingdon and Ealing Highway officers' view. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, originally, the development proposed 76 car parking spaces, and then that was reduced to 65 car parking spaces. And um, I really did press the application team um, 
how can you show me that the development works with 76 spaces and then because my colleagues are negotiating for things like uh, the uh, design of the building, the number of car parking spaces uh, is reduced. And I, I really did push the application team from the developers to explain to me how the development could work with uh, a lower number of car parking spaces. Um, I can only guess that the comments you've received in the report from Ealing are still those that refer to the higher number of car parking spaces. Um, only one set of comments were received from Ealing. Curious. I mean, it's uh, fair enough. I mean, I, I suppose it confirms my impression that, uh, with all due respect, respect to professionals, these, these, these matters are su su subjective things. And we, you know, well, okay, fine. Nothing more to add on that. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you very much. I've now got Councillor Higgins, followed by Councillor Mathers. I don't want to be mischievous about healing and us, but we'll leave that there. Um, I don't know whether the gas work, they were so generous with us with the gas work, so that's the only thing that I would argue that um, with the contributions that we had for using Manette as a green space, but that's a different application, different time. I want to go really back to the engines. Um, diesel engines now are actually, well, some diesel engines actually are cleaner air comes out of them than goes in them. Um, I don't know whether that applies to these type of diesel generators. and. I'm, is that is there some in future to have some more exploration around the engines because I'm sure that there'll be a German generating engine that will be carbon neutral generated you know there's diesel engines that are very very clean so anyway so I just wanted to raise that point to say from few in future because we will have a lot more of these coming through is it possible us to explore um, the options on particular generators, whether they are some are better than others. We do we used to do that with the air filtrations for restaurants and stuff. Remember, they've got improved as they've gone on. So, is it something that we can look at in the future? I mean, we, we are definitely pushing the um, data centre applicants hard to make uh, on the air quality and the carbon offset to make these as green as yeah. possible. And I'm sure that they're. Uh, I think the direction of travel is in the future. We will have smaller contributions, yeah. if, if I'm honest. Um, but um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's cer certainly sp it's been a particular focus of, of the officers. So I can I can give members that reassurance that there's certainly been a lot of focus on air quality and carbon offset in determining this application, pushing the applicant as far far as we can. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely happened in determining this application. Yes, thank you. True, Chairman, because obviously engines have catalytic converters that are going to generate us have those sort of things as well. That's all I find. Yeah, I think it's um, good for them to actually, it's good for the, the reason I'm bringing it up because it's good because the applicants are probably here and all listening to us, and it's something for them to think about because in, in, if they can find an engine that doesn't, then they'll be giving us less money. So, you know, But it helps us because the engine there will be cleaner. One thing, thank you for that, Councillor Higgins. One thing that did catch my eye when reading the report was Condition 34, which actually talks about catalytic reduction technology. So it's, I think it's uh, similar to what we have in our Euro 6 uh, cars, uh, as we've got diesel engines. OK, Councillor Mathers. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, firstly, uh, a point of clarity, if I may, on the carbon offset. It, does that include construction and, and what proportions uh, uh, is offset for construction and um, the, you know, the running or operation of. Um, I, I think my, I know we're hopefully, well not hopefully, this sounds terrible, we want less contribution in future because we're going more carbon um, zero and, and I think you mentioned 35% in the future was going to be reductions, carbon offset on site and the rest would be elsewhere if I heard you correctly. I'm just wondering if there is, I, I wouldn't want to put too much pressure on the developer because in, in general I agree that data centres are needed, this is important for the vibrancy of our industrial states and our you know, wider um, benefits to the borough, um, but by raising the bar on what's expected as carbon reduction on site, we are effectively set, set a precedent for what we would expect from all developers going for, uh, forward for these sort of centres and, and other industrial spaces. And I wouldn't want to set the bar too low where people can just pay off 
to carbon offset elsewhere when more can be done. And I think that's been generally the argument around the, the diesel generators, but not just the diesel aspects, also the you know work, um, home to work stuff, the um, just general efficiency of the building. I mean, it's, it's electricity that's running. Um, well, it's all electricity, isn't it, really? And so, uh, you know, the sources from which that comes from obviously helps reduce the amount of carbon, even though, it, you know, it may not necessarily contribute directly where we are, it has a wider impact. And so I just wanted to get a bit better understanding around the offsetting and how we can make sure we're raising the standard. I also do have concerns around the height, because if our industrial areas develop, we've set a precedent outside of policy of something higher, so we could end up with a whole estate with buildings at this height across the board. And they could all be data centres, I don't know. Um, and I wonder if that, I'm not as experienced as everybody else around the table, but um, I wonder if that's something that would normally be acceptable because of the advance in this type of industrial use. Um, but if it's a precedent that we want to be set this at the moment. Okay, a couple of points there, I think, was the. Um the construction offset for you know what element of the for the construction is from the uh, carbon offset contribution, uh, and there were some concerns here around the height. I don't know if you want to pick up. Yeah, if, I, if I can do the second point again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, the wider context to this site it, it is there is the Crown Plaza tall building uh, at the entrance to the industrial estate, and as a committee we've allowed a similar. Uh, size building adjacent to that from the Park Hotel and then you've also got the Southall Gasworks developments uh, the other side of the canal and that definitely involves some tall buildings, uh, uh, quite a number of them. So uh, we have taken into account the sort of wider context here and it, in terms of other industrial estates we'd, we'd always be able to sort of look at um, the material planning considerations such as height on their merits and if a different industrial state adjoins a conservation area, then that conservation area policy could be used by us to basically take a different approach. Um, so uh, we, I think, and I don't think we mentioned it earlier, but we we were mindful of those uh, of the wider context here that there are other tall buildings. So it, yes, it isn't in terms of the way when we dra originally drafted the part two local plan we. <laughs> it's very restrictive in terms of Uxbridge and Hayes Town Centre, but this is nonetheless a location where there are visible tall buildings. So that I think that is a relevant factor that kind of does slightly weigh in the balance of, in terms of this being a favourable uh, recommendation with respect to the tall building issue. Thank you, Chairman. But I think the other point there is, is in any applications which come in front of us in the future, we would have to look at all of those aspects in relation to height and deal with that, deal with the plan that's in front of us um, at, at that time. So, um, okay. And the other issue around the, the carbon offset contribution that Councillor Mallers raised. raised. The, the contribution is specifically with regard to the development itself. Now, when you've obviously mentioned the recycling of materials during the construction phase, that's actually covered by things such as the circular economy policy. So the applicants have lodged a circular economy statement, and that looks to um, that looks at net zero waste during the construction periods and beyond. So when the building is defunct, how will the materials then be recycled? So we do have a circular economy statement that the that the council were happy with, that the GLA have commented um, provided initial feedback on and asked for enhancements to the statement. So there is going to be an element of um, recycling during the construction phases, but it's not captured in that carbon offset sum. Sorry, Chair. So, so, so my second point was, was uh, I understand that, that, that was helpful for my knowledge, um, how we ensure that more carbon offsetting is done on site. Uh, I think that, that, that for me is about making sure that we set a standard for similar developments in the future. And also just quickly on the, the height, um, this is on the south side. It's the only tall building, to my knowledge, on the, the south side. So it is setting a new precedent on the different. I know the size is not massive, but it's significant. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, uh, I would clarify that the buildings I refer to are more than 100 metres away. Uh, so they are sort of wider context. So the more immediate, it, it will be clearly taller than, this, than the adjoining buildings. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Andy, do you want to come back on the, the other point? <coughs> yes. So the London Plan Policy 
stipulates that 35% reductions must be delivered on site. So there will not be less than 35% on application sites unless they are breached. Yes, we can obviously push for more, but each site on its uh, will be assessed as and when they come in, and we will try and reduce the sums to try and get more on site. I think this probably could have had more if there was any feasibility of having PV panels on the roof, but that wasn't possible because of the function of the building, so we've achieved as much as we could on site, and the rest is um, being ploughed back into other uh, carbon projects within the borough. Okay. You okay with that? Okay. Councillor Cawthorn, you indicated. J just briefly, uh, on the back of the height question, I note that the uh, Harmsworth Conservation Area Advisory Panel uh, have not raised objections. I assume that's what this means. It doesn't mean we haven't heard from them. So, I'm going to just throw that in for, for what it's worth. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. I'm not seeing any members indicate. I'll remind that we are moved, but we're not seconded. Um, oh, Councillor Chapman, you as I'll second it before Councillor Duncan beats me to it, Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So now we are we are moved and we are seconded. Um, and again, some very good debate, I think, from this committee. So thank you very much for that. So I can go to the vote, please. All those in favour? Do you check? You just round up. We have some bits and pieces. Very uh, correct to, to pull me up on that, Councillor Higgins. So we had a verbal update from Mandip on. Um, the contribution for damage cost one is now 649490, is that correct? And we were going to add an informative explaining the public art expectations. Yeah, that was in the, the 278, in the heads of terms already. Yeah? Okay. Right, so that's what we're moved and seconded on. Can I take a show of hands, please, for this application? So that is unanimous. So agenda item 8 this evening is approved. Um, so that brings us to the end of the meeting. Um, I'd like to thank members this evening for again some very high quality scrutiny on these applications. I'd like to thank the officers for supporting us this evening and of course thank uh, people that have been watching us on the YouTube channel and we'll close the meeting. Did you want to come in Councillor Duncan? Yes, this is my last meeting, my last council meeting, my last uh, planning application. Uh, meeting. So I'd just like to thank all members that I've worked with over 20 years and all officers that I've worked with over that time. And um, I've, it's not only been a great pleasure, but I really think that where we've worked together, we have delivered some really good schemes with officers and members on both sides working together. Uh, and I hope everybody feels the same, but I, I do feel that we have improved things and made them better. So I'd like to thank all of you for that. Thank you. And I, and I think, I think Councillor Duncan, I can speak on behalf of this committee, and I think I can also speak on behalf of previous chairs of this chair, chairs of this committee, just to say your contribution is always well valued, is always well respected, and has done some magnificent things for the residents of Hillingdon through, uh, through planning application so I think on behalf of everybody here we'd like to thank you thank and you wish you well and wish thank you well. You. Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you. Uh, I, I must just say uh, that Councillor Duncan you were still a planning officer when I was first elected back in 1993, 29 years ago this month so uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed working with you over the years as well. I think we have worked well together on these matters and it's good when we can so uh, very best of luck to you in the future. Thank you. Well done. Okay. So on that note, anybody watching on YouTube, we will now bid you good night and uh, yeah, see you all after the election. <laughs>